We, if, if we believe that there is a God, we know that there is a God, and we would say then that God is good, and if then there is a good God, why is there evil in his world? You can take these examples from the news, or you can take examples from your own life, and this is a big question. The question is put in the parable that we heard read in different language because it is a parable, it's a story, where the servants in the workers say, why are there weeds growing with the wheat? This is a way of asking the same question. Why is there evil in the world? Didn't you plant good seed? Of course, the farmer planted good seed. So why are there weeds growing in here? Why is there evil in the world if God is good? And we talk about the question here this morning, and you may be shocked by the things we saw in the news, but we're just talking about it. And it's a very, very different thing when you feel it. When you personally are wrestling with evil that you have experienced or that you have seen. It's not then just an intellectual idea that we talk about. It's something that is deep in your soul. And I hope that we can address this both with the mind and begin to address it on the level of the heart. Because this is one of the big questions that our world has. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. This is the story. And Jesus is saying, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is what is, it is like. This man who sowed good seed, but there's also the seeds of wheat that are sown along, seeds of the weeds that are sown along with it. Jesus is saying this is an illustration of something that is true about God's kingdom. Not everything, but this is one thing that is true. And when the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. And all the commentaries on this passage, the people who study the Bible and know the historical background, they say there was a particular kind of weed, and there still is, called a bearded darnel, that looks just like wheat when it is young. This one on the right is the weed, bearded darnel. The one on the left is the wheat. You can tell they look pretty much the same. And they look the same until they are are uh, bigger. So at the beginning you cannot tell they grow up together and in the end then you can tell the difference. And it was actually, it seems like, who would ever go and sow weed, weed seeds? This one is actually poisonous and if you eat too much of it you get very <coughs> sick, you can even die. So it's a serious thing. It's not just, oh, I have dandelions in my vegetable garden. There's poison alongside the weed, wheat which is used for, as a source of food. And there, were a Roman, there was a Roman law against doing this sort of thing because it could be kind of something you do to your enemy or to get back at somebody. You put weed seeds in their crop and ruin the whole thing. So this is the story that Jesus says. This is something like the kingdom of God. There is good seed and there is some enemy that has come and put this bad seed also. So the owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Well, of course he did. And they already know the answer, but they're confused and troubled by this. They say, Where then did the weeds come from? Your quality of seed we know was good, so where did the weeds come from? And the answer then is, in the parable, the owner says, An enemy did this. And this is the first part to our answer, or, uh, first part of the answer to this question of why is there evil in the world, is God responsible for evil? Did God make the world and put good in it and also put evil in it? Did God put evil into the world that he created? In the parable it says, an enemy did this. The owner of the field is not responsible for, he would not plant weeds in his own crop. And one part of the answer, Jesus explains, as the weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. That evil does not start with God, evil starts with God's enemy, the devil. And some, we, we uh, know some things about the way that this enemy works, some by our own experience, some by what the Word of God tells us. 
uh, the source of evil, the enemy, and his tactics, the way he works, is for us to deceive, to convince people that something that is not true, to convince them that it is true. We see this happen in the Garden of Eden. The story is one thing it's meant to tell us is how the enemy works, convincing them that if you eat this, it's not going to be bad for you. It's going to open your eyes and you will be like God. This is deception, convincing them that something, a lie, is true. And then also tempts them, makes it look good, makes it look like something desirable. And we experience this too. Things that deep down we know are not good for us, but we become deceived and we are tempted and we come to believe that if I only had this, then I would be happy. Of course, deep down we know it's not true. And then the third thing that the enemy does is to accuse. Once you've been deceived and you've been tempted, then he is in your face saying, there's no way you can ever be accepted by God now. These three things. But there's another question behind this, and I know some of you are probably already thinking, okay, well, God, if God is not the source of evil, but the enemy, the devil, is a source of evil, then where did this enemy come from? Did he not come from God? Did he just always exist? Where did the enemy come from? And here is where the Bible gives us some hints, but it doesn't give us full answers. The Bible says some things about angels who were created good, angels who rebelled against God, but it doesn't give us a whole story, and it does not especially answer the question of why was that evil allowed in this world? And why is it still allowed? We don't really know the answer, and this is a, a troubling thing. We read news articles, we hear from people who are personally troubled by evil that has happened to them or is, is oppressing them, and we can ask the question, why? Where did this come from? Where did this enemy come from? And again, we have some hints, but we don't have full answers. And there's a book that I have read recently by a man named Christopher Wright, and it's called The God I Don't Understand. And he's a, a, man, a Christian uh, a professor, and he's wrestling with some of the big questions like this. Why is there evil in the world? And he's admitting even in the title, I don't understand everything about God. But he's trying to understand the best he can. And wrestling with this question about evil, he says, God has chosen in his wisdom not to give us an answer to our questions about the ultimate origin of evil within creation. Does God know the answer? Of course. He's saying God is withholding that. And God has chosen not to tell us everything about evil in the world. And he goes on to say that there's, there's maybe a reason why God has not said this. He says, the final truth is that evil does not make sense. It is irrational. It makes no sense, the things that happen in our world. Evil does not have any meaning. It is, it is by definition, not good. And he says, evil can have no sense since sense itself is a good thing. He says, if evil made sense, then there would be something about it that was good. And it's not good, so it can't even have sense. That may be a little confusing, but he's saying God understands his world, and he chooses not to say everything about it. And in the end, we will say, evil makes no sense. It is senseless. It is just evil. Evil is completely evil. It takes something that is good and twists it into something it is not meant to be. Now, that's not completely satisfactory for somebody who is suffering to hear the answer, well, we don't know. But this author, Christopher Wright, is saying, there's no other answer to be given we're left with an open question, sometimes. So then, what should we do about evil in the world? We get some hints at some answers, but not a full answer of why it is here. But what should we do about it? In the parable, the servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? Should we pull up the weeds? Should we get it out? Let's remove it, right? Seems like a good response. There are you know, poisonous weeds growing. 
shouldn't we go and pull them out? And the answer, answer is no, because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. That's not, that approach is not going to work. So if we make it our approach to, the, to evil in the world and say, well, just leave it up to me, I'll get rid of evil. I'll sort through, I'll prune, I'll, I'll do the weeding, and I'll get rid of evil from the world, or my political party will do that, or my new government, my new regime. We will go through and we'll get rid of all evil out of this country or even out of the whole world. There have been people who have claimed to do that. It does not go well. And one of the reasons that evil is not just something out there, it's also in us. And unless we can root out the evil from our own selves, we will become just as corrupt as the people we say we want to replace. So what would happen if we started removing evil people from the world? We could get a list and just say, well, hey, what if God removed, um, you know, everybody who's planning to commit a murder in the next month, if they would just disappear? <laughs> Wouldn't that be good for the world? And what about people who have, I don't know, uh, stolen money or large amounts of money? Or maybe stolen anything? What if, what if we say, God, if God gets rid of anybody who's stolen every, anything ever, and, you know, people who do really, uh, you know, violent things, or just any kind of violent thing, at least God gets rid of them, and people who cheat on their taxes. Wait, wait, that was too close to home or something. Yeah. <laughs> the problem is we make a list that ends up so long, we've removed everybody except me. <laughs> And maybe a few of my favorite people. Right? If we begin the process of judging everything evil and say, well, let's just get rid of them all up. He says, you're going to pull up weeds with the weed. We don't have the kind of judgment that it takes to make those decisions. And so, the wheat and the weeds are left growing alongside each other. One is good, one is poison. There, are, there is good in the world, there is evil in the world. There are people who do good, there are people who do evil. And it's not that it's fixed. There are people who can become good. This is called repentance and faith. When somebody whose life is committed to doing evil decides, I'm going to change my life by surrendering to God and receiving this gift of salvation, sins are forgiven and they become a new person. So in other words, the weeds can become wheat. And if God was to pull it up now, it hasn't, it hasn't waited long enough. Or if we were to pull it up now, it hasn't waited long enough. And so another question is, what kind of world do you want? What things do you want in this world? And this is a question not for us, but for other people who have the same question, these doubts. We want a good world, right? I want a world where things are good. Where there's not violence and injustice and these sort of things. So I want that, I want a good world. But I also, I want a world where there is freedom. Do I want people, do I want somebody to force me to do the right thing every time? I don't think I do, right? I want to make real choices, and I want other people to make real choices. It's just that I want them to make good choices. I want them to do the right thing. This same author, Christopher Wright, he says that uh, he, he used to be a teacher, and he gives this example about goodness and freedom. He says, hey, let's say I have a classroom full of students, and I, I tie them all up with ropes into their chair, and I gag their mouths so they're not able to speak. So they're, they're stuck there. They're tied in the chair, and they cannot speak. And then I tell them all, stay here, don't go anywhere, and don't make any noise. And I leave the classroom for an hour. And then I come back, and hey, they haven't moved, and they haven't said anything. He says, could I say, you are such good kids. You did exactly what I told you to do. They were only doing what he told them to do because he had taken away their freedom. And there's nothing to say good job about. If, on the other hand, they're left in the classroom without being tied, without being <laughs> gagged, and they stay where they are, and they stay quiet, and he leaves for an hour and he comes back, then he has something to say, good job about. And for God to give us a real life as human beings, it has to include the possibility 
of doing wrong. It has to include the possibility of choosing evil rather than choosing good, so that choosing good is a real choice. We want a world that has goodness. We also want a world that has freedom. Are you willing, do you, would you even want to give up one in order to have the other? And if we take it another step, there are other things that we want. We want justice in the world, right? We want people who do evil things to be brought to justice. That is a good desire. However, when it comes to ourselves, then maybe we want something different besides justice. What we want then is mercy. Ah, see, when I've done wrong, I'm not calling for justice anymore. I'm calling for God's mercy. And how in the world can we ever have all of these? How can we have goodness and freedom and have justice and have mercy? It seems like an impossible thing. But this is what God has given us. It's a difficult world. It's a suffering, struggling world. But it's also a beautiful world filled with God's love and goodness and his forgiveness. What kind of world does God want? Well, God wants these same things. He wants a world and he wants people. He wants us to be both good and free. That we are choosing it, not being forced to it, not bound and gagged so that we don't do wrong, but choosing to do good, choosing to love others. This is something God wants for us. The Bible, this is why the Bible is full of commands and encouragements to love one another, to forgive. God does not make us do it, but he asks us, he tells us, he commands us to do it. And when we do not, then the Bible shows us that God is grieved, he is sad, he is angry. Because these are not the things, God does want goodness and freedom, and when there is evil, and there is oppression, God is not pleased with that. God also wants justice and mercy, and he wants us to be just and merciful, to do the right thing, but also to be forgiving. And therefore, God is patient, God waits, God longs for us to come to him, he longs for us to do the right thing. He longs for us to learn, to follow Him, to be filled with His Spirit and follow the way the Spirit leads us. And what is God waiting for? What's He being patient for? What's that about? And this again in the parable, it says, let both grow together, the weeds and the wheat, let them both grow together until the harvest. That's the right time to sort things out. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. So I'm just waiting till harvest time. Then I will sort things out. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So why doesn't God do something about evil now? It's not harvest time yet. God is being patient and waiting, wanting people to return to him, wanting people to repent. Also, I'm not going to read it, but to look up later, Romans chapter 2, verse 4, says about the same sort of thing. And in the end, after God has been patient, at the end it says, the harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin, and all who do evil. This week, I spent one night uh, walking around the backyard of, of the, our house, the manse, and I was crying because I was overwhelmed with sadness, not just my own sadness, but the suffering in the world. In Sudan, there are children who go to school in caves because their school buildings are being bombed. And I was walking through the yard, crying and praying, God, how is this possible? There's such evil in the world. I struggle with this same question myself on a personal level. 
our own loss and sadness, but just the suffering in the world, the evil in the world. And the next day I sat down, I had my Bible propped open, I was on my computer ready to work on the sermon, and I'm reading and I get to this line where it says, the Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin, and all who do evil. And again, I cried, because I need to know, you need to know, God will remove evil at the right time. He will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And it's not like it took away the problem. It doesn't take away the question, but it gives us hope. We look to the future, and it's not just everything's going to get worse and worse. There will come a time when God sorts things out. And evil will be removed. And that's what this parable is teaching. That's what Jesus is teaching in this parable. And then it does add this. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And there are people who don't like the idea of judgment in the Bible because it sounds too severe, too harsh. Now I would just say, if you go back and read the first three news headlines that I started with, you decide, is it too harsh? for God to punish those who do evil, who do such things. Is it wrong for God to hold them accountable for the evil that is done mm -hmm. to children, to the weak, to the disabled, to the elderly, to people who have no defense of their own? Is it wrong for God to come to their defense? Is it wrong for God to hold those people accountable and for them to pay a price? That's what justice is about. That's what judgment is about, is justice. Uh, this, um, borrowing from this author again, Christopher Wright, he talks about the complete evilness of evil. There's no way to explain it otherwise. There's no way to even make sense of it. It is simply evil. On the other hand, we know that God is completely good, and these seem very opposite from each other, and we wonder how could a completely good God let something so evil exist in this world Especially because we know that God is completely sovereign. God is in control. So then we, it really makes the question even harder. Why does God allow this? And he says, really, the only way that we see how these, are come, that these could be uh, uh, overcome, this kind of problem, is through the cross. The cross shows us the complete evilness of evil. How could that be done to the Son of God? The one person who was without sin was crucified. That is completely evil. And on the other hand, it shows the complete goodness of God. God loves the world so much to let this evil happen to his son so that we can be forgiven and saved. That is amazing goodness. It shows us that God's plan in his sovereignty in the end, he will overcome all evil with his goodness. We can do the same thing with these other things that I mentioned, goodness and freedom, justice and mercy, that seem uh, uh, opposed. How can you have all of them together? Again, the cross, the willingness of Jesus to suffer and die, shows us how they can be kept together. And this is the world that we live in, not just full of evil, but full of the goodness, the kindness, and the power of God. Now, we have to wait, too. God's, God is waiting, so we have to wait also. And I was going to put these as three separate points, but then I realized they're really all together. These three things. We practice patience, we pray, and we protest. I remember, the reason I say that they're all together is because they're all together in the Scriptures. In Romans 8, it says, We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. So we are patient, we're waiting for it. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. So while we are waiting, it is a painful place to be. We groan inwardly, and do you not sometimes just, you're overwhelmed with the sufferings and the trials that you must go through or that happen in the world. And you groan inside. 
and yet you pray. And if you don't know how to, what to pray or how to pray, the Spirit Himself who is in you prays and brings your needs before God. Again, about protest, this groaning is a way of kind of complaining to God about the situations that we face. And this is okay. This question of evil, the problem of evil, it's not just that people came up with this two years ago and said, hey, how can there be a God if there's, if there's evil in the world? This has been in the Bible for thousands of years. People who were close to God had the same question. For example, in Jeremiah chapter 12, he's a prophet. God spoke to him, and Jeremiah says, You are always righteous, Lord, when I bring a case before you. He's saying, God, I know you are just and you do what is good. Yet I would speak with you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do the faithless live at ease? This is exactly the same question. God, I know you're good, so why do you let evil people do so well? And there, it's interesting, he says you have planted them and they've taken root. See the overlap of the parable of Jesus. They've been planted, they take root. They grow and bear fruit. You are always on their lips, but far from their hearts. There are people who talk about God, but in their hearts they are far from God. Religion, or using the name of God, is no guarantee of goodness inside. He says, you know me, Lord. You see me and test my thoughts about you. He's saying, look, I'm trying to do right, and I'm suffering other people who are doing evil, and they're rooted, and their, their lives are fruitful. Habakkuk chapter 1, another prophet, he says, how long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? The wicked hem and the righteous so that justice is perverted. Here he is complaining, protesting to God about evil in the world. This is not a new question. Psalm 73, I encourage you to go home and read this whole psalm. He says, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure at heart. He knows this because it's part of his faith, a part of his experience. God is good. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. And he goes on to say, they're proud, they're violent, they're wealthy, and they give no thought to God. How's that right, God? Because my feet almost slipped, I nearly lost my foothold. He says about himself, surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I've been afflicted and every morning brings new punishments. My faith is doing me no good. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. It's not just an intellectual thing, it's deeply troubled. As for me, my feet had almost slipped, I had nearly lost my foothold. He's got this feeling that faith and obedience is worthless feeling of being troubled, confused, and disturbed by this problem. And he is in danger of losing his faith altogether. And some of us have been brought to that point by the evil in the world or by the things that we have suffered. And here we have examples in the Bible. It is acceptable. It is okay to bring those very troubles to God and say, God, why? And how long? And what are you going to do about it? It is okay to express those questions, express that confusion and those doubts to God. And in the psalm, it goes on. He says, when I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. Right after this, it says, until I entered the sanctuary of God. I came into the presence of God. And in a, in a time of worship, somehow... He understood. What did he understand? Their final destiny. The harvest time when the weeds and the wheat are separated. Surely you place them, these people who do evil and care nothing about God, you place them on slippery ground, you cast them down to ruin, how suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. He says, I understood that in this world we will suffer, and sometimes it feels like faith is doing me no good, and yet I understood the bigger picture where the future leads. Almost at the end, hold on, hold on with me. There is another problem of evil. People say, if there is no God, why is there evil in the world? And if people conclude then, there must not be a God. There is a different problem of evil that the atheist has. If you decide there is no God, the question of why God allowed is evil, that goes away. 
Because they say, well, there is no God, so I don't, I, it's not, not a problem. But the other problem, then, is why call anything evil at all? If there is no God, there's no such thing as good and evil. There's just things that I like and I don't like. And there's things that you like and you don't like. And if you like doing something that harms me or my children or anybody else, all I can say is, well, I just don't really like that. But why call it evil? Evil means it is objectively, absolutely wrong. And if there is no God, you can't say that. You just say, this is my opinion. This is my feeling about it. And yet we live in a world where people are not willing to give up the idea of good and evil. They're not willing to give up the idea of morality. That there are good and bad things that happen. And why does it bother you. That's just how the world is, right? If you believe the world is just the, the result of random processes, of uh, somehow the world came to exist and human life evolved to the point where it is without any kind of God, then that's just how things are. People are mean. People kill each other. There's people who do all sorts of violent things and sexual things and why does that bother you if that's just how things are? It bothers us because this is not the way things are supposed to be. And we know it because God has made us to know it. So there's just another problem. You get rid of one problem and you create another one. And you also suffer. Without God, you still suffer. But then you do not have the same hope, the same resources to deal with. According to the Bible, we should be troubled by evil. It's not something to be accepted. It's something to struggle with and to protest to God about it. It's okay to protest to God about evil in the world. And in the end, God's goodness will overcome all evil. So how do we wait? By patience, by prayer, and by protest. And just add these two things. Also by faithfulness and fruitfulness. And one way to be fruitful might be to work for justice in the world. If you have the chance to save somebody from slavery, to save somebody from, somebody from human trafficking, to save somebody from being cheated by their landlord because they don't know the law, you should do it. And that is a way of being fruitful as a Christian, as you are waiting. And there are hundreds, thousands of other ways of living a fruitful life as we wait for God's kingdom to come. Final victory, as it's mentioned in the psalm, says, uh, in the parable, says this. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Those who have committed to following God and his son Jesus Christ, and whose lives are committed to doing good, in the end they will shine like the sun.